Hello, and welcome to Historic Trinity Episcopal Cathedral in the heart of downtown San Jose. I am Dean Julia, and this is my last Sunday in this role to lead worship with you. So it is a particular but rather bittersweet joy to welcome you and to pray with you as Christian people begin our worship. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the, their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one holy and living God. Amen. My friends, this will be my very last sermon from the Trinity Episcopal Cathedral platform. And you know, I've gone and made a mistake, as one does at the very end. I preached from our first lesson from the Book of Numbers, even though what you just heard read was from our gospel. Generally, the gospel drives the sermon, and you'll hear a little bit of that. But today, since you may not have read Numbers 11, I'm going to give you a brief review. So the Israelites are in the, in the desert following Moses, and they're not happy. Um, they're complaining about not having enough to eat, not the fish we used to eat in Egypt, and cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and all of the good stuff that they may not really have had. Have we ever felt like that? But longed for anyway. And poor dear Moses, who would put up with all kinds of craziness, um, is exhausted. Exhausted. Where am I to get meat for all these people? He says he complains to God. And God says to Moses, gather for me 70 from the Is elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders, people and offices over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. That is to say, he asked Moses to delegate a little bit, no bad idea. But that is probably where my sermon should begin because even though the, the 70 elders are commissioned to share ministry, something quite unexpected happened. So let's listen in. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them, lamented Moses, some 15 centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ. And today, on this my last day at Trinity, I am surrounded by prophets. So are you. Look around you, virtually or imagine around you, and maybe take a moment to say a prayer for all the people connected to Trinity, who are prophets. 
We are priests and queens and kings too in all the realms of community and family that we influence. You may disbelieve that at times. I certainly do. It's human to doubt ourselves and our calling. We get depressed. We get sad. We suffer actual loss and get sick and have to take time to heal. We may just not be in the mood to prophesy today. But here's the deal for we Christians. The Spirit is on us. God has given us, all of us, the Holy Spirit in baptism. It's actually not up for debate. So as I myself prepare to bid farewell to Trinity, I want to remind you that you have vowed to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. You have vowed to persevere in resisting evil and repent whenever you fall into sin, to proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, and to strive for justice and peace among all people respecting the dignity of every human being. That is how we prophesy. God has given us everything we need to do it. And frankly, I see Trinity people doing it every day. But let me offer you another model of prophecy after the example of Moses himself. Here's what I noticed in that first lesson from Numbers that I just summarized. Moses got tired of his impossible job, and really, who among us has not been there? But Moses prayed about it, which we don't always do. Sometimes people in this oh-so-common human situation just get mad or blame the people closest to us or go online and express hatred toward an imagined enemy. You know this happens, even if you don't do it. But Moses had the humility to tell God the truth about how he was feeling. He asked for help and he got it. Moses invited 70 others to share his burden. And after he had all those partners in ministry, he still paid attention to what God was doing outside of the tent of meeting. That's the surprise I promised you in my introduction. Eldad and Medad, as you may recall mentioned from our first lesson, were not among the 70 chosen by Moses and commissioned by God. They were outside the tent of meeting, and no less a biblical luminary than Joshua, Moses' eventual successor, objected to their unofficial prophecy. I get that. We in the Episcopal Church actually get that. Over the years, we've objected quite officially to the ministry of women, LGBTQ people, young people, and people who don't look and sound like us. In this, we're actually not that different from other faith traditions who have tended to replicate leaders who resemble ourselves or themselves, as the case may be. But we took vows to respect the dignity of every human being and to repent when we do anything less. And because of that, we've changed. At its best, our Episcopal Church is blessed with the humility of Moses. What is our tent of meeting at Trinity Cathedral today? And who are the prophets that God has empowered to do his work outside of it? I can't really tell you who are the outsider leaders whom God has called to prophesy together with Trinity. I'd love to, but that's actually not my job anymore. That privilege belongs to you and to your next dean. But I can invite you into the time-honored spiritual practice of paying attention. So I leave you with this charge. Pay attention. Notice what God is doing inside and outside of our historic tent of meeting. Notice the 70 and more who are called to be inside this beautiful sanctuary every week. Learn their languages and their names. 
even if they go to a different service than you do. And notice too, the ones on or near our campus who prophesy by their compassionate service among our most vulnerable neighbors. I think of front door communities serving with us every day, Octavius Kitchen and Santa Maria Urban Ministry. Notice also the artists and the musicians and the hungry and the lonely and those longing for God's promised and preferred future as our vital and thriving congregational development initiative calls us. Jesus, Jesus is bread for the world. This we know. And we here in Trinity will continue in the breaking of it. But those outside our doors may just be the salt we need to complete the meal. So taste, my dear friends, and see that the Lord is good. Amen.